Where is the stable? Where is the manger? Where indeed is Mary, the mother of Jesus? And the angels? And the ecstatic shepherds? <clears throat> Why is John robbing us of the Christmas story? These are really questions well worth asking because the answer is the most important part of the whole story. Jesus the Christ was a real man. We know that. We accept that. And as such, had to be born the way that men are born. We accept that. We know that. But, however, because of his very nature, the birth was different. And yet it wasn't different in ways that would be so unusual as to be off-putting to the ordinary people with whom he would grow into maturity. The people who would accept him as one of their neighbors, their kin, and ultimately, their teacher. And so, we have an event which was unusual enough out of the accepted norm. An unmarried young woman becomes pregnant in a miraculous manner. She is engaged to a pious and long-suffering man who loved and cared and brought up Jesus in a normal household. That's the story that we celebrate and make much of every year. We elevate Mary and Joseph and make much of the tender, charming story. And the picture stays in our minds and our hearts. And we pass it on to our children in all of its lovable and endearing representations. And then we come to John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John's words are stark, uncompromising, in your face, as we would say. And that's exactly as John meant it to be. There is no noodling around about it. There's no halfway. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This indeed is what all the Christmas story is about. This is what the cradle and the baby and the Blessed Virgin Mary and the shepherds and the angels and the trees and the gifts and the music, and the beauty, and the charm. This is what it's all about. But we all know that. We celebrate the birth of Jesus, the birth of the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, we know. And then what? We celebrate, we honor, we pray, we try to spread joy and happiness and goodness to our families and our friends and the world around us. We help the needy, and it's good. And then we pack it all up, and we take out the tree, and we burn it. And we move on to a new year, and we'll come back to the manger again next year. Maybe then, maybe then, there will be a difference. You know, the Book of Common Prayer is an amazing work. We probably don't think much about how carefully and prayerfully it is arranged, especially the chosen readings from Scripture. 
You are probably aware that we have a three-year cycle of readings for Sundays, which allows us to hear the variety in all four Gospels. But what I want to point out is that the readings for the first Sunday after Christmas, that's today, in all three years, each one of those three years, include this passage from the Gospel of John, which we just heard. Every year we hear this passage, just as we hear of the stable and the shepherds and the angels. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the heart of the Gospel. This is the heart, the meaning of the Christian faith. To paraphrase Paul, if this isn't true, then we are of all people most deceived. Quite frankly, we are quite nuts. What are we doing here if it isn't true? Remember that word, the Torah? The law that was given to Moses, it was the means by which the Hebrews knew God. It was God's design for their lives, given to them. For generations, they carefully carried it with them. It was the sacred center of their life as a, as a people. They, they copied it, and they read it, and they studied it, and they obeyed it. It was God's presence with them. And now, the Word has become flesh and blood. This man, in the very midst of them, was the revelation of God himself. John tells us, it is God the only Son who has made God known. The deeds and the words of Jesus are the deeds and the words of God. The invisible God is made visible in the person of Jesus. We have heard this so many times. We have heard it so much. But we really need to. It's so easy in the rush of our lives to have it become commonplace. Of course, Jesus is the Son of God. And I breathe in, and I breathe out. No, let's go on. I think that that's why the prayerful people who put together the readings in the prayer book want to make sure that we hear John's proclamation at least once every year. Because it is a life-changing statement. John says, no one has ever seen God, but God's only Son, He who is nearest to the Father's heart, he has made him known, known, <clears throat> known to us, accessible to us, to you, to each one of you, not far off, and not off to a holy mountain or a special temple, but right here, right now. This word from John that we hear every year is vital to our lives as Christians. It is the energy source that empowers us to live as God wills us to live. After all, if Jesus is not God incarnate, then why should we listen to him, believe in him? And we certainly would pray to him that would be useless. God created us, each one of us as individuals, and as individuals, 
he relates to us, to you, to me. It is through Jesus that this relationship can flourish. Relationships, as in a good marriage, grow and flourish with attention. One of the old hymns <coughs> excuse me, that was very popular years ago and is still in use today is In the Garden. Probably some of you know it very well. Some of you might know it. Some of the words are, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. We might consider it rather sentimental, and God save us from anything sentimental. <laughs> but it points to the very truth that Jesus does desire a close relationship with us. What better proof do we need than the fact that in a few minutes we will be receiving the communion with him that he left for us? and with very specific instructions as to what it is and how important it is. This is my body. This is my blood. We have so many choices today. Have you noticed? I mean, it is literally unreal. From food, to entertain, to exercise, to new sources, to, to news sources. Everything is available in a multiplicity of styles, including paths to God or spirituality. And I'm nothing against that. Nothing at all. But what the Gospel of John is telling us is that no one has ever seen God. But God's only Son, He who is nearest to the Father's heart, he has made him known. He has made God known. And he makes God known to us. The Jewish people worshipped God in the temple. And God visited them through the high priest when he entered the Holy of Holies. Jesus, God incarnate, God and here, our language fails us. We call Jesus the Son of God, but the title Son seems almost to diminish him. We call him incarnate, God in human form, but that seems so much like the gods of Greek and Roman mythology who regularly came to visit people for one reason or another. John pretty well exhausts the limits of language in conveying the message of who Jesus is. John finally says, No one has ever seen God, but he who is nearest the Father's heart, he has made him known. We encounter God, true God, from true God, right here today. And we encounter God any and every time that we turn our hearts and our minds to Him. He is always there, waiting for us. He is always ready to hear us and help us. His love and care are beyond measure. I think if we had any idea of how much he wants to hear us, we would never hesitate. We would never be shy.